What's up, friends? Welcome to another episode of the Great Day Podcast. I'm your host, Mayor K, and today's guest, I am super excited. He's a friend of mine for over a decade, and that's, it's been amazing to see him grow. He's a rabbi, he's a tailor, and not just any tailor, he's a bespoke tailor, the highest of the high, the creme of the creme. Today, we're going to delve into his story, into his journey, his challenges, his triumphs, and the, the art of tailoring, and, and so much more. Please give a round of applause and a welcome to the one and only Yussel Tiffenbrunn. What is up, man? AK Rabbi Taylor. We are sitting in your workspace office. I know you have a special word you call this a atelier. Atelier. That's where'd you pick that up? Um, it means like a workshop studio kinda. So that's what it is. How's a nice Jewish boy like yourself pick up such profound, uh, incredible language? Um Probably through um, the tailoring and traveling, uh-huh. um, through my Singapore, through Japan. Okay, we're gonna get back to all, here. Okay, probably. we'll get to you. Get to all your yeah. travelings and all that, all that saga. Um, do you feel though, as sometimes, I mean, you dress, you act, you have. I mean, just before we sat down, there was classical music being played in this atelier. Alt- atelier. Yeah. Atelier. And um, it seems like you have this. I mean, I always felt us from you. Like you, we we go way back, and we're gonna we'll go through that. We, I mean, I know you. I know you now, Yasso. For I mean, good well. I knew you for good over fifty. I would say know you for over fifteen years, but I know you well for at least uh, ten years now. Yeah. Right? Our ten year yeah. anniversary. What yeah. up? Yeah. Boom. Love you. Um, so like I've always, you always projected a like this old soul type of you know vibe. Uh, what do you think? Where did you get that from? I don't know. It's an old soul. It's an, it's my soul. So it's um, I was always I guess that old soul. Um, I think maybe it came from my grandfather that had that influence on me. Um, he was an artist and what kind of art? Uh, portrait art mm-hmm. and uh, portrait oil. And um, I think he had that influence on me. But I think the old soul is and that it's either you you're an old soul or you're not an old soul. It's it's. Uh-huh. It's not something you, you so you're born with it, or, you're, it's, or you get it through over time. Do you feel like you've progressed and grown into this? I've definitely, um, over time, um, developed tastes for for more things which are kind of you would say old soul, like or how classical would you say music. It? Also, is my, my no, it is. I mean, it? it is definitely. And, and, and in fact, I, I some of my workers that I have here as well are also like kind of old soul. Um, they appreciate classical music and jazz and, and that kind of environment. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's something that, uh, it's just a part of me. And, and yes, it, I guess it developed over time. It became older, I guess. Mm. You're like a Benjamin Button. <laughs> something like that. I don't know. <laughs> the, what I it's do. old man who's going, yeah. yeah. The tailoring is also, it's, it's an old, you know, it's an old dying art. Um, which you would usually find people in right now in their 70s, 80s, um, you know, still doing the craft. Uh, most, you know, you don't have too many young people, especially in their 20s, um, doing tailoring. Um, it's there is a revival, but it's definitely an old craft. It's an old soul kind of craft. So, mm. so you mentioned that the you mentioned that the art of tailoring is a dying art. So, are you worried that your clientele will also be dying? Um, No, actually just the opposite. Um, You know, I would say out of the last 20 clients, my last 20 clients that I've had, um, 80% are in their mid-30s, early 30s, early 40s, and even some in their late 20s. So we're talking about a pool of people that are developing a taste for craftsmanship and uh, that are appreciating authentic, genuine um, experiences. Um, I think many, you know, people that have tried different custom tailors or different different you know, um, clothiers or, or people that are selling suits and made in different countries and you know they take the measurements and it comes back ready made and it's hard to really correct a a, a jacket on someone once it's already made uh, so people are looking you know they've spent two thousand dollars twenty five hundred dollars even three thousand dollars and and are not happy so they're looking for something um you know more of an experience more personal something that's really built around them and that's what we do here so 
you know, you have all these young clients that are that have come through the door and um, are really, you know, going through that experience with me, which is uh, it's a lot of fun. It's mm. it's really. So what can one expect? What can one what can one expect when they come through a, a tip for Bruno experience? What's that look like? Um, well, first of all, your your you know, one thing I wanted to mention just on on the other thing is that, you know, part of the tailor to client, you know, that relationship is is something that people have always had that relationship with their tailor. It's you know, they're going to see their tailor, they're going to sit down with their tailor. So it's also very much about the space, the environment. They're coming here, spending time here. Um, it's very personal. It's a personal. Yeah, it's. It's, uh, you know, we enjoy time together, we drink some whiskey, have coffee. Um, I have clients that come here, um, even, you know, in between their, their suit being made, or I have clients that come and watch their suit being made. Mm. Um, watch me cut their jacket or, or their trousers. So it's an open space, they could actually see it being made. Um, generally, most, you know, most clients don't necessarily have the time to do that, but but um, it's an actual open space environment. They could see that clothing being made and, and the process of it. Um, so it's very much about the relationship sure. um, with the tailor. And um, then what kind of experience are they getting? They are getting a suit made entirely by hand for them um, from the beginning to the end. Meaning client comes in, you know, we get to know each other a little bit. We uh, take his measurements, we choose fabric, the fabric comes, we lay the fabric um, on the table, right over there, uh -huh. cut the fabric. Incredible. This is the bespo bespoke way of... This is the true bespoke way. So what is the, I mean, I mean, I, 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 someone like myself, you know, I, I've, I've been purchased, I've purchased custom made suits and they're far less, you know, expensive, I would say, with, you know, than what, you know, fancier suits or bespoke suits are and I'm curious to know like what is special about a bespoke, bespoke uh, suit? What's how's that differ from a suit that I would get off a rack? In, I don't know Zara or Brooks Brothers. Yeah. Okay. Number one is apart from I'll well, we'll talk about the fit. I'll talk about the, the choosing the fabric. I talk about everything, but from the fact that you know it's being made for you completely from scratch, you know it's built for you. That is one thing in general, and you know it's built by someone that you have a relationship with. So that's, that's something uh, in itself. Then there is obviously what it is, is a, a suit that's built for you entirely. And what does it mean handmade? It, it means that it's been molded for you. A lot of the work in a bespoke suit is, is um, in the inside, the canvassing, um, the construction of it that you wouldn't see. Um, the client would see it during the fitting. He would see the different parts of it, but it's, it's, the kind of like the build up and the way it's made and the way it's constructed and, and the shrinking with the iron and the stretching with the iron, and um, it's the molding. All that goes into developing something three dimensional, um, so it flows in harmony with the body because, mm. you know. It's, it's so true. I've seen your, I mean, I've seen the behind the scenes of one of your suits being made. And it was incredible that you had like these paddings and places that I've never seen before in other types of suits, like the way it fit the chest and the shoulders um, and how it really molds to the body. And yet you don't lose any flexibility um, from like, like just the opposite. Just yeah, the, right. Yeah. Just the opposite, exactly. So is that, so is what defines, so is that defined bespoke? Like what defines bes a bespoke suit? So what defined bespoke originally was that it had to be made within a square mile of Savile Row. A Savile Row. Yeah, that was, they had the word, it was the fabric and the, the, the suit was spoken for, bespoken, spoken for the client. Mm. It meant it was made entirely for the client, entirely by hand. That was the old method, that was the method. Of, of tailoring and um, and then you know over the years you know everybody's taken the word bespoke and, and you know bespoke light bulbs and bespoke paper and bespoke well, you name it but but bespoke came from tailoring and over here we do it the same exact way how it was done back then back then and you actually learned your craftsmanship on Salvo Row yes so tell me more about that that experience and who you who you who you study under with. Um, so that was around 
eight years ago, eight and a half, nine, eight years ago, somewhere around. So you're there. like, I want to learn this craftsmanship. I'm going to go to the source. I'm going to go to where it all started. Yes, exactly. Uh, I actually, I actually had um, ideas of wanting to be a fashion designer. Ah. Uh, a women's kind of evening couture, kind of following Alexander McQueen. And Alexander McQueen started off on Savile Row, so he had his first few years. Uh, on Savile Row, and I believe that's where he he developed his craft and and his which which a lot of his his work when his work was was around tailoring like tailoring gowns and tailoring uh, you know different it was a lot about around the craft. So I I kind of loved him as a, as a designer, and I kind of followed that path. I felt like you know I could sketch fine, but I wanted to understand what I'm sketching, and and then. You know, so obviously I went knocking on all the doors of Savile Row, asking them if they took an apprentice. Um, I'm, a young, I'm a young rabbi. Just um, that. Um, yeah, I just, I just knocked, I just, just knocked on the door and got one no, and then went to the next door and got another no. And after like 20 no's, I was like uh, feeling really, you know, should I continue? And I continued. And what pushed you to keep on going? What this you, yeah, this well, is what I wanted to do, and. Um, what you know the store is there what is what's going to start you know okay, i just have to push myself to go in and just ring the bell because a lot of the doors and stuff are all closed you got to ring the bell they got to uh -huh. open it um and so you know it's it's actually it's actually a lot harder because you got to ring the bell you got to wait for someone to come in that waiting period is a lot more period. intimidating and then you know they answer the door especially for you sure and then you ask them what you you know you take apprentices or you know and tell them about yourself and and then you get the no and you felt like okay you know he you know and you know there was someone nice about it some you know it's Savile Row it's London it's very posh you know you know, you know so so it's um, some were very nice about it some weren't as nice and yeah. uh, especially you know I'm a religious guy I look like a like a religious man and. And um, so yeah, that was that was interesting. So I found out about a tailoring course, which a lot of the companies were uh, connected with. Um, and uh, I went to that, and then I realized after six months that this is not gonna not gonna be it. So I uh, went back. Wow. Went back, and then um, there was one company that had their own tailoring academy, and I applied for that, got accepted. And which then, which academy was that? It's called the Savile Row Academy. It's run by. Um, Professor Andrew Ramroop, which Andrew is a master tailor. He he owns Morris Sedwell, which is number nineteen Savile Row. So I, you know, I had met him earlier on. He recognized me. I got accepted to the academy, and then after like a month in the academy, he took me on as his apprentice. Fantastic. Um, so yeah. I would continue under the academy and and then in the French shop and practice as well and at the under shop. Him, yeah. And beginning, what kind of uh, what what kind of apprenticeship was it? Just a simple. It was a, everything. It was you know making him coffees every day, um, um, croissant runs, you know, uh -huh. and fixing light bulbs and hoovering and and uh, cleaning up and and obviously preparing fittings and 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 taking what I've learned in the academy and. And at the same time, bringing it into the French shop. So it was it was a very hands-on experience because you know you could you could learn something in an academy, and then it's hard to really picture it because um, you know when you're in school, for instance, and you're learning anything, it's hard to actually picture it real life until you get your internship. So here, I was actually doing both at the same time. So it was very it was like a double it was like a double amount of experience because I was taking it there and actually bringing it into reality. Yeah, you know, a room Incredible. away. Yeah. yeah, so that was uh, yeah. I would do everything: pad collars, deal with uh, clients, make them tea, you know, make them coffee, uh, answer the door. Um, Which, by the way, just from the from, from hearing and listening to what you're saying, that in itself, right? Well, it may seem like just like a meal, like little jobs, getting coffee, talking to clients, but part of the bespoke experience, it seems like, is to have this personal connection. Absolutely. To learn how to talk, how to be there, how to be yeah. present yeah. with the person. So it doesn't just start and end with the suit itself, but rather once they arrive and all that dialogue and all that connection. So. And you had you had customers coming from Malaysia and their Rolls Royce. They just got off their private jet and they enter. You had. And celebrity clients that would come up, you know, mm -hmm. there was one in particular that I had no idea who he was, and 
and uh, I answered the door. He asked if Andrew was in, and I said he wasn't in, but I didn't know who he was. Yeah. But he was like the most famous cricketer ever. <laughs> and so he said, yeah, sure, I'll pop by. I'll come by soon when he's around. And he was walked off with... And, How do you uh, know and that? The, the tailors at the back said, do you know who that is? That's like, you know, that's... You know, um, Brian Lara. So, he, so I was like, no, I, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you had you had Fantastic. all these very interesting, Coming very amazing experiences. Yeah. Wow. So I mean, you you did touch on, and I want to explore that a bit more because it's interesting to see how you ended up in bespoke tailoring. When you mentioned that you got into this, the passion really started from fashion, not just fashion, but women's fashion. Where? How did that journey from women's fashion? Being a rabbi, all that conflict, and t- let's bring us back to that time when, you know, you were uh, figuring that out and how it led you to, to where you are today. Okay, so I always wanted to, from a young child, I wanted to design, I wanted to have my own brand. Clothing. Clothing. I wanted to have my own clothing. Where did that start? Did you saw something in a magazine? You saw no, I don't know. I don't know. I, it, just was, it was a young age, maybe 9, 10, 11, it was a very young age. That was what my dream was. And did you feel have. like it was different and unique or weird because you were in like in yeshiva, you grew up in an orthodox, ultra orthodox home? No, 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 no. I didn't see any. I didn't. I was too young to, to, to understand what would, if there would be, you know, what would be the setbacks or what would, why I couldn't do it. I, I was just that's what I wanted to do and that's what I, you know, planned on doing. Hell. And I just, on that thought, it just blow. It just it's so interesting when. I hear that it's like as children we just like there isn't any if buts or maybes there's like this pure unadulterated confidence and love and like yeah what's why can I do it yeah. this this amazing just like focus that we have like I want to do this and I'll get it done and then throughout life there's like these journeys of no's that come away and blockades that yeah. put a lot of doubt on that journey it's funny because you know my daughter it was a you know she was watching a video and uh, my daughter's three and Beautiful. Um, yeah, you have you have you have two children, huh? Two children. Yeah, yeah. And so she was watching and there's one, you know, these on, uh, on these videos on YouTube. So, yeah. A Mary Kay video. Um, it wasn't. Not, uh, uh, I don't know what it was. It was. Uh, it was. Um, Fireman Sam. Uh, or something like that. But, okay. But so one of the advertisements there was um, there was a, a girl skateboarding or something and on a pink skateboard. So this young three year old wants a pink skateboard, and she wants to go skateboarding. So, you know, one day, maybe, you know, we'll get our skateboard, but she wants to go skateboarding now, and she's saying skateboarding, and she wants a pink skateboard. But that's a very young dream, as she's three. But I, I, had, I had some sort but of dream. But just like that, if I call you out, a small little dream that she just has. But if we look back in psychology, a lot of our thing, a lot of our wants and needs and passions come from very young, young age. You're right. And it's like... I'm not going to tell you how no, to plan no, your no, children. No. I'm, I'm, I plan <laughs> yeah. on getting her a and skateboard. It's beautiful. Okay. And at the same time, it's like, you know, it could be in a certain sense like, oh, you know, I'm sort of writing it off. But it also could be a way of explore, exploration. You know, who knows why she can, is connected to this thing. Maybe I'm just putting too much weight to it. And at the same time, it could be something which would be very passionate. And the first, you know, Absol- who knows absolutely, absolutely. where things yeah, come I, from. I agree with you. I yeah. agree with you. So Ariella, if you grow up and you listen to this, you become like this major skateboarder, you know why. Uncle Mayor hooked you up right there. <laughs> so take me back. So you're at a very young age, you're interested in, in fashion and in, in that design. And so you're six. But as you grew older, how did that uh, how did that come into actuality? So I would I would always dress differently. I would always, well, differently. I would always push my boundaries in, in, in what I wore. Even in yeshiva? In yeshiva, you in had to yeshiva, wear a white shirt, black pants. How yeshiva, did you change that up? when I was 13, when I was 15, I... I would, you know, let's just put it this way. I would have a little bit of, not friction, but, you know, with my mom, I would have, not friction, but it was, it was, you know, she... Don't she, speak freely, your mom, I don't think we'll hear yeah, this Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's <laughs> so, <laughs> totally, yeah, it's totally cool. Um, she would, you know, she would expect, you know, as, a, as from a religious family, you know, she would expect us to be in check, you know, because, you know, worried how other people look at us and how we how we're seen by others, and it's it's, it's how it is always in communities and, and you're the especially oldest parents. Ever. And and I'm sure maybe I'll be like that, you know. What I mean, but hopefully not. But but uh, it's up to you. It's yes, up to me. It's really. up to you. And you're also the oldest of a bunch of, of siblings, right? Yes, I'm the oldest of so, ten. I'm the oldest of ten. So so I wow. yeah. So it was it was very much. I had to you know I was the oldest and I was looked at and I had to set an example. Um, but when it came to clothing, I, I, you know, there was, there was, um, 
those boundaries that I felt like I needed to push and I wanted to push. And I didn't feel like there were boundaries that I had to push. It's just that I, you know, I wanted that shoe, I wanted that suit, and uh, I liked it, I wanted it, and I would, you know, convince and I, I would eventually get it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and very from very early on, I would stop buying my own clothes. You know, 14 years old, you know, I was I was buying my own clothes, but I had my. I remember my mother bought me my first three-piece suit when I was nine. Um, so um, I had little suspenders as well, mm. and I would take care of my clothing. I would really, um, when I got a new suit, I would um, come home from shul, from synagogue, and change out of that suit, put like an older suit on, or or you wow. know a casual pair of trousers and a white shirt, and hang that back in the closet. And if it was shoes, take it out, put it back in the box. Wow. Um, and so I seen. I mean, I was the total opposite. I was going. I my parents didn't trust me to suit till I was like bar mitzvah, and even then I was like ripping them and sweating them. Like yeah. Right. So that that taking care of the clothing was was like for me clothing. I don't know. There was something about it that I would take care of it. I would and. And even till today, obviously, I mean, I, um, you know, I have my, for instance, you know, I have a wedding hat that, that is five years old that is in perfect condition, absolutely perfect condition. And, and uh, a lot of, you know, I would, if I kept all my clothing from, from back then, they would be in perfect condition. Mm. I mean, that's, that's how I, so I, I developed this, this, you know, this taste going, going on and in clothing and, um, I enjoyed uh, shopping and you know getting a new suit every so it was every Pesach or every you know twice a year once a year whatever it was and um, it was an experience it was special for me it was something uh, it was uh, something special and you know then I went to yeshiva went to France went to Israel that's yeah. where I met you yeah, that's right yeah, that's where we met for the first time in Israel that's where we sure. met for the first time and, and, right. and uh, 18 yeah. and now we're 29 now yeah Isaac. yeah yeah so, uh, did when you shared your? I'm going to talk about Israel. Did you share your vision? Um, do you remember that time you shared it with your parents that you wanted to perhaps get into fashion? Because we're, I mean, you go to yeshiva, right? Yeah. We go into. We're, it sort of it's, it conditions us to be shluchim, to be rabbis, and we both got our degrees or biblical degrees later on. Um, and your parents, your your dad's, you know, a, a, a cantor. You know, he's 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 an artist himself, and he's part of a. And your mom is uh, what's what's your mom do? My dad actually, my mom actually makes these beautiful arrangements. Um, um, these, like, uh, for instance, Purim, uh, but there's like a companies in the UK. Yeah. And um, these these uh, companies that prepare um, these wine with chocolates, these, all these little, little packages, little packages, packages, but they're insane right beautiful. now. They're not just little packages; they could go up to a uh, th thousand, fifteen hundred uh, pounds a package. Oh, wow. you know, and people are buying them, and not just for Purim or, or for Jewish holiday. You're talking about on a weekly basis. Someone oh has gosh. a baby. Um, people are outdoing each other with different packages. So she designs um, it. So she puts them together yeah. and designs them. And with, with the oh, so you no <laughs> your your family is no stranger to 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 art and to design no, and to no no. So when you shared this to, with your parents, who what was their reaction? Well. I guess they, they heard about it from young. They, they knew I had this, um, this kind of passion. Maybe they didn't really understand it. And, um, um, and then it was actually in the middle of Yeshiva when I was, when I was gonna go to New York. And I must have been, um, I turned maybe 19, uh, something like that. Yeah, 19, 19 makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was gonna go to New York and I was on the fence. You know, I was having a summer in LA great summer with a bunch of guys and in a you know we a day camp and i felt like you know what maybe i should just go to fashion school this is what i want to do um you know why continue in yeshiva if i want to be a fashion designer what's it going to help me and i had this little struggle and my parents convinced me you know they they thought it was a good idea if i continued continued in in the system you know continued finished finishing yeshiva up and um and that's what I did, and that's what I did, and I don't regret that for a minute. Um, they were right; um, they were definitely right because I'm here today because of that path that I took. And you know, sometimes you don't, you, you know, you zoom in, you don't see it, but you got to right. zoom out. And, sure. And so they, I guess, you know, as parents, they, they, um, in this case, they probably knew they knew better. And um, so I went, I went to that yeshiva. Um, it was a great year. On the side, I would sketch around different, you know, during the learning, I would, I would sketch. Mm. 
and uh, that was the year before we went to Singapore actually yeah, together. Right. And um, yeah, so it was it was that year. But at the same time, I had these dreams, and I knew that I'm going to do it at some point. I just it was just kind of continuing this it took some time to process this journey. And I had to finish this journey. Um, and, you know, go through the years of yeshiva, and and uh, then take it from there. And and it was that year that we went to Singapore together. Yeah, I, I remember in Singapore, and I found that to be really cool. And I, I admired that you, while we were we were went about, we went on to Singapore. We were supposed to, it was a one year program. We turned it into a two year program, and it was going so well. And um, I had a passion for video and whatnot, and I was inspired by you. I never took action in it, but and I made my videos in Singapore. But you actually took time, um, especially in that second year, to take courses, take classes in design. And it was very interesting to see the progression um, of of your of this world of, of fashion and design that you've taken upon yourself. Because initially, like you shared, it started off with women's fashion, and then uh, I remember you coming back and you went into interior design. And it was like the struggle it seemed like for you to. And I love for you to hear your perspective. From my perspective, it was like you're just trying to make this work and in a kosher sort of setting because mm-hmm. you know, women's fashion. It's neas and it's modest, and I don't know if I could do that. But you want it to be designed, so you went into interior. You went into design around uh, 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 furniture. And I remember still today. I don't know if you still have it, but remember that love seat that you had. It was a really cool love seat that you created out of wood. That it was um, these two seats that balance the shape of the heart, shape of shape of um, a, 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 a male and a female. Mm, that's what it was, a male and a female, and you, it took two preps to sit in it, and it balanced each other. It was like this little, you know, uh, ba- uh, what is it called? What are they called? Um, it, was a, it was like a it was a seat, like a seesaw a kind a seesaw, of yeah, a seesaw. Yeah, which which. Type. Which you know when you know it would it would balance each other out, yeah. Yeah, and I thought that was so innovative and so beautiful, and 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 yet that didn't satisfy you, right? It, it, that didn't fill fill the need of design. Here I am telling you, but yeah. So tell me what that like what that process looked like from from wanting this want from women's fashion and going through design to here you are with bespoke sure. men's tailoring, and has the design for women's fashion died? Was still in there within you. But so first, that's a lot to. That's a lot to. Yeah, it's a lot. It's okay, just, so I, I start off that you know, as we were in Singapore, what we were we were doing in Singapore, we were we were you know helping volunteering for the community. Um, well, I don't know what we call volunteering per se. I mean, it was sort of yeah, we got paid a monthly salary. We got paid. A, well, it was more like a tip. Yeah, yeah we got paid yeah. a tip. We got paid a tip. Uh, How did you spend your money? Um, not like you spent it. I spent it on you spent, clothing. Right. So it's funny to see. Right. You spent your money on clothing. I saved that money up pretty much for traveling. But yeah, that's yeah. I'll be my own podcast. But so, yeah, yeah, you so, saved so it. So I you, saved it and I spent it on clothing. Yeah. You, yeah I had a new suit. Okay, so you, yeah, yeah. yeah. You literally came back a different time with shoes and suits. Yeah. Yeah. That was, you know, that's 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 me. That's, you that's and Yuri. Yuri also. Yuri yeah, also. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, yeah, we were together. It was you, yeah. Yuri and Mandy. Yeah. And we were helping the community doing, you know, all sorts of uh, um, great activities for teens, for students, for, for young professionals, for the community. We became party planners and, uh, yeah. and at the same time we were starting to become rabbis. We were. And we were being, we were rabbis to, to, to a, a huge amount of people, all sorts of people. Yeah, Kids we, and, and, and we were rabbi figures. And uh, over time we, we, you know, I... I I guess it rubbed up on me, and I really started enjoying that too. And and I didn't believe that I would be a rabbi. I didn't at some point, you know, I want to I look at myself as a fashion designer. I didn't think I would I would I would be I want to be a practicing rabbi, but something along the, that path, it really kind of you know, I fell in love with that kind of. Um, it woke something up within you. Yeah, and I really enjoyed it, and uh, I actually started seeing myself potentially, I could do this, you know, mm-hmm. full time at some point, and. At the same time, obviously, I didn't. I had this these passions for for clothing and for design, and Singapore was a great start. You know, we it was something that actually we, we decided to stay a second year. So I made a deal with the community that I would yes, that I would right. go and study. But so I had this kind of how should I do it? Should I do fashion? But now I'm a I'm becoming a rabbi, and I have this this part to live up to. And and women's fashion. If I go to fashion school. You know the atmosphere, the people, and the design. I, I felt like it was, it was a struggle. It would be a struggle, um, for me. And um, I wasn't sure if I if that was the right path to take. Um, maybe I could take something which was right, like you said, more kosher, more balanced. And I went and I started studying um, interior design. 
Nice. Part yeah. of the interior design was furniture design, so I did, you know, prospective drawing and CAD and the the that I made that love seat for my, for right. my furniture. I remember you actually used this uh, one of your excuses. We had we had in this apartment of three rooms, yeah, and um, it was four of us. And there was like this one big room, which two Mendy and Yudi, two guys were in. And then there was this middle room, a small room. And then there was this large room, which is its own private bathroom. And then that room was taken by Biamen uh, Stone, a fifth guy, a gentleman that he left um, after some time. So that room was vacant. And so it came down to Mendy and Yudi were fine staying in their own room. And it came down to me and you deciding who's going to get that big room. And somehow you decided that you're going to claim this room. I, I decided the minute he left. That you need the space. I decided you needed... that, that, you know, I'm studying now. I felt like I could do with that space. Yeah. I ran it by, you know, whoever it was. Uh, it didn't make rabbi. more sense but in the then, long run. You had a lot but, more stuff. Than but I, I had like a whole desk there that I could do my drawing. You more clothing than me. You needed more closet space. I get it. Yeah, the closet space I wasn't <laughs> worried about. It was actually the fact that there was a desk there right. that I was able to set aside time to, to do my drawing. It was a lot of drawings I had to do, you know, develop different different things. But I, I, found, like, I found like I was putting fashion bringing fashion into my drawing, into my, into interior design. And I realized like, what am I doing? Uh, you know, I'm designing a room for, uh, designing an apartment, you yeah. know, cause we all had to for a project design an apartment, a certain square foot, square meter. And uh, I chose to design it after Oscar de la Renta, you know, which was also one of my favorite designers. And, and you know, I designed this lampshade in one of his, you know, out of like a woman's kind of, dress a gown kind of an evening gown with like an umbrella and that was the lamp mm. and that was in the master bedroom and uh, i designed this awesome bookcase which i'm not going to say right now because i want to do it at some point mm. um but it was connected with a designer and it, there was fashion 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 and i realized that who am i kidding i want to do fashion yeah i have to do fashion and um that's when i you know i finished the, the that that course and I started taking some, some fashion illustration courses on the side. And then I landed myself a internship at Harper's Bazaar magazine. Wow, incredible. Yeah, which was awesome. And that was the end of Singapore, the last few months. Yeah. And uh, I did two months, two and a half months at uh, Harper's Bazaar, you know, you know, helping them with... What's Harper's Bazaar for those who don't know? Harper's Bazaar is one of, one of the leading fashion magazines in the world. Um, in Singapore, it was one of the top for sure, and I was working under the the editor in chief, um, at, and uh, it was a great experience. Yeah. I was on the shoots. I was on, uh, and I was focused more on the men's side, but also helping with the layout of the magazine, helping the editor directly, and and uh, it was very interesting. It was a great experience, and there, I had the first. I would say the first openly Jewish experience in a meaning I was in a non-Jewish environment a secular environment um, surrounded by people that are not Jewish um, um, which you say you had the influence had the potential to influence me in certain directions yes. and way but there I was with my kippah with my yarmulke and uh, and everybody, you know, it was, you know, I went and had lunch actually with, with, with the workmates and I bought my own lunch in silver foil. You know, everybody was having these really cool, you know, great food, which, which I love, you know, yeah. like Indian food or local Malay food, you to keep kosher, Singaporean yeah, food. It was amazing, yeah, okay. you know, yeah. and I r unwrapped my silver foil. Um, <laughs> tuna sandwich. Tuna sandwich, exactly. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, and I was there openly Jewish, proud Jewish. And and it was it was great because it was it was it was that was my first, you know, um, step I think for that I can do this mm. that it can work as you are. There's no reason for it that you could show up as you are as a religious Orthodox you know Jew, rabbi. Yeah. And at the same time, do what you love and do what they love. Do what I love, and and then there should be no reason um, why anything should change if you, you know, showing that you know you this is who you are and. Um, and they respected that, and that was my first. Um, hey, you know, this is this can work. Yeah, well, an interesting point. <laughs> an interesting point that you mentioned, and I wanted to just bring just bring some value to that, is um, you were saying that you were in interior design school, and you were there like trying to maybe even fool yourself and tell yourself that this is maybe something I could do, but yet 
even though you were in this world of design and creation, it still didn't feed that passion, that hunger within you. And I find that so, so many times in life, we fool ourselves. And we have a certain dream and goal, but we think, ah, it's not possible, or we can't do it. And we write it off, or we try to trick, our, trick ourselves by doing something that's close to it. So we go 70, 80%, maybe 90%. And we're in the world, we're engrossed in it, but yet there's still that little bit. We're not fully at 100%. And that eventually catches up with us and we realize there's something missing, something missing. And it's only until we align ourselves with our true passion, with our true calling, do we feel fully empowered to move forth and, and really hit the hit the goals and, and the places that we really want to be. Amazing, yeah, it's so true. Really, really true. And that's 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 how I felt. It was there was something missing. It was just wasn't you know, I wasn't achieving I wasn't satisfied. Um, and I realized that, you know, who am I falling and I gotta I gotta do what I need to do. Incredible. So you got you. You were working for the magazine, and you landed this. Um, so you went back home, and then you. So landed. then I went back home, I, and I to London, and um, it was actually I was going to work for a company, a local company there. Yeah. Um, which over my time, I did go to different fashion shows in Singapore. Yeah. And, um, Remember that we go local. back. We come back from like learning or doing a project, and like where was Yussel? Yussel was out at some fashion week. He was there <laughs> checking out the dresses, checking out the fashion. It was uh, it was cool. It was interesting. Yeah, that's yeah, that's we, uh, yeah yeah that's what I did on, on my spare time. But obviously, it was in, in Fashion Week because Singapore does have you know they yeah, they have their Fashion Week and mm -hmm. there was uh, some local families um, right. in the community that that owned a brand and 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 had the rights to many different brands and they were very a part of this yeah. Singapore Fashion Week. I think it's important to give a nod towards the Singapore community, uh, the Jewish Singapore community that we were volunteering with because they were so open-minded, they were so welcoming to our personalities. And I think that's what was such a great fit with us is that they, you know, we, they understood our capacity to being leaders and teaching schools and, and giving classes, being rabbis, and at the same time allowing, for example, yourself to, you know, express this passion of yours. And to grow in our own way. Yeah, I think, and they're yeah, very supportive. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I was surrounded by... Shout out to Singapore! Shout out to Singapore, to, to the, yeah, to all the, to everybody in the community. Um, they were great mentors and, and great uh, personalities to have around. Yeah. You're talking about ambitious people you're talking about people that have did great things achieved great things and that's why they're there in Singapore representing right. companies um, from all over the world and uh, it was a great you know it was a great energy to be around and yeah. it motivated you um, they were to hungry. aspire to yeah. be to be at that level uh, uh, and 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 then you know we had dreams and you had you know what you did and uh, the videos and and they and you performed for them and yeah. and they loved it and they were really supportive and I had you know this fashion dream that I would you know I had one family that on on Sundays um, maybe not on Sundays but they would they would like, every so often I would go to them on a Sunday they would cook me a curry lunch mm -hmm. dinner. And you and your curry. which I loved and yeah. which I developed in Singapore. Yeah. And they would they would um, record the project runway and we would watch it together. Oh, fantastic. And they were so supportive till today. Till today. And a shout out to Andrew Lim yeah. and family, Andrew and we Andrew. Literally, yeah. yeah, we were literally listening to Andrew Lim as I walked in to your to your atelier. I'm, I'm never atelier, here. yeah. Atelier. Um, Andrew was on the radio. Okay. Yeah, so so I listened to to <laughs> so to the radio station through Sonos speakers. I listened to Singapore radio station, which which Andrew is is um, produces the, the show, yeah. um, and he's an MC in the morning. Yeah, he's such a rock star because he even hooked us up with like sh tickets to shows in Singapore. He knew I was. I he was, was so supportive. So of you supportive. Too, yeah. yeah, he was in the, he's in the entertainment world over there, exactly. and so he was. Yeah, always you, asking, give me tips. You did a gig one time. You did. That. I did a gig one time. Exactly, yeah. Andrew. What a guy, and Angie and the whole family. Yeah, he hooked me up. I, 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 I was a, I was a whoopee. Yeah. I was a whoopee for a, uh, a, a TV show that they had, and I was the guy that before and between breaks to like go and pump up the crowd, and MC, motivate. Um, it was a really great experience. I had the whole headset, and it was, it was so interesting because. They were the producer were talking to me in my ear as I had to project and talk to the audience. It was awesome. It was a really great experience, and that was all thanks to, thanks to Andrew to, and Angie. So they, they were great, people. and they're yeah, like you mentioned, we were running the different programs, entertaining, um, entertaining on the weekends, on Shabbos, on Friday nights, um, the different hands-on programs that we did. Right. So there was one actually one in particular that that I think suddenly some skills and uh, developed. I mean that I realized that I had because we had to do backdrops. Yeah, for a pouring party. Yes, from the, the Wild West. 
or the X's as well. And yeah. and there I find myself painting huge backdrops, yeah. you know, that's feet and feet of yeah, and of all different things. And uh, that's you know the art came out, and so I think it was, it was yes, it was absolutely Singapore and the community that helped us um, develop, you know, like at least give us the foundations and the motivation. Yeah. To, to go ahead and, and achieve what we you know what we need to do. It is interesting to look back, you know, because you know, as they say, like when you're in it, if things are hard and you feel like it's the end, it's just not the end. You still keep on going. So there's some tough times and rough times. And if you look back on journeys, right, like you'll think like, oh, you maybe 18, 19, you were thinking about not going on to yeshiva, your parents convinced you to go. But it is how cool it is to look back and as we get real older or we just get mature more aware to see like these little you know, breadcrumbs that all led to this, you know, I learned something here, I learned something there, a connection here, a conversation here, that they all mold and grow and are part of like this mosaic that we call self. Um, it's, it's amazing. You gotta just, we, unfortunately we, I think we don't generally do this, but, but uh, we're doing it right now. We're going back and reflecting, but, but uh, you gotta, yeah, you gotta go back and, and you gotta go through that journey and, and look back and see where you, where you started and who was there and, and, um, who picked you up in those times? And there was one in, one time in particular that that um, when I was going to work for this local Singaporean company, I was going to have an internship there mm -hmm. after the yes. magazine, right. and it fell I mean, through. Right. Yeah. Um, you were bummed. And I was completely bummed. Yeah, I, was, I remember that, that. was that for me. I was like, okay, I'm going to continue on in Singapore, which I loved. I was going to work for for one of the local companies, and that was going to be my fashion. You know, that was my entry. Um, I was completely bummed, but thank God, thank God that didn't happen because, you know, my journey started from there, my real journey in, in the craft of tailoring. Right. So I think back to that time and what now the, a big, I mean, you've turned yourself into this now Rabbi Taylor, right? Rabbi Taylor, two sort of, it seems like two different distinct worlds and you're fusing them together. Um, how does you know the the rabbi and the tailor come together through the work that you're doing? Well, I would say first of all, it started. It's the rabbi tailor kind of um, this you know this combination um, in actual wording you know on on social media or whatever. It came along because I was at this event. I happened to well, it was a tailoring event in in London as an apprentice. I I was not supposed to go. And Why were we supposed to go? Because you know it was it was for the tailors, and oh, for okay. those that that um, um, took part in the show, and then a young apprentice. Uh, I was not part of that uh, invite. You mm. know, I was not part of that. You know, the tailors went. Right. My boss went. You have your place in turn. Uh, yeah, it's your not place there. as an apprentice. So how'd you end up? Now, one of the tailors couldn't make it. I took the place. <sighs> and, HP baby. And then you know I was there. I was wearing this red, this like burgundy. As you can see, is my favorite. I love burgundy. These everything. walls are painted. I have, you know, burgundy socks. I have a burgundy yarmulke. I, there's always something on me that's burgundy. But I had a burgundy triboli, this little hat, and I had a burgundy bow tie, and I had this vintage um, that I got for maybe like you know 25 pounds. This vintage double-breasted um, one uh, was it uh, one and four uh, um, button closed, and I was there at the, uh, and after at the at the event. Um, and after the event, um, I was there standing around. They had cocktails, and the GQ added up. Um, his name was Nick Carvel. Yeah. And he took a picture of me, and he wrote, "Best dressed goes to at the event, went to Rabbi, to Rabbi and Taylor, or Rabbi, yeah, Rabbi and Taylor, at the company that I was." So it was actually Yudi that messaged me. He saw it on the Instagram yeah. of GQ, right? And then he, and then the editor knocked on the next day and said, you know, you, you know, have you seen? And you know, the company were very happy because I mentioned the company that I was in, and that's when I started the Rabbi Taylor thing as as a social media. And then I got many interviews, and I was in Time Out London and different articles. But in actuality, the being a Rabbi Taylor is when I got married, I moved away. You know, I left Savile Row. Um, I got married to my wife is from New York and we decided to New York wasn't gonna happen and London wasn't gonna happen mm -hmm. so we decided to make Singapore happen amazing and I had developed a connection uh, with a tailor local tailor there in Singapore um, and uh, we made it happen I was gonna work as a rabbi 
for the community and as a tailor. There you so go. That's the fusion I, of worlds. The fusion of worlds. And, <clears> I, <throat> and I actually did it. I actually, um, w you know, I ran services. I, um, I did Friday night dinners for 180 people. It was rocking. We loved it. We had, we had a we had a growing young community with kids, with children, and and they were active, and and it was so much fun. But at the same time, I had a nine to five tailoring job, and I felt like it was getting to a point that both were growing tremendously, and especially the rabbi part was growing and growing, and they wanted me to be there full time, and to quit the tailoring and to be a full-time rabbi. And, and I had to decide, and that was a little challenging. That was, it wasn't a little challenging, it was very challenging because I, I enjoy both and I, yeah. loved, um, I loved it. I, was, I really loved it, I really enjoyed every part of being a rabbi and building relationships with so many right. really cool people, cool. young families and uh, expats, a lot of expats from, from you know, from obviously the States, from America, from South Africa, Australia, and you meet the most incredible people. Yeah. Being an expat, surrounded by expats, is a certain family, and you connect with people in a whole different way. You make friendships that you can never make anywhere else. Um, I, I had to decide, it was a rabbi or tailor, mm -hmm. um, full-time, because the community wanted me to, to continue uh, on as a full-time rabbi. Uh, so I was up with this challenge, and I didn't want to give up my dreams of fashion. And I felt like, um, as a rabbi doing tailoring, I felt like that that has, um, you know, it has a story to it, but it also has that uh, that um, potential to to you know make a difference as well to many other people globally. Yeah. Um, and I felt like I had to make that jump, and that's when I moved back to 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 New York. But but I was in in, in Singapore actually. A rabbi and it and it actually it worked both because I had you know I had clients that came to show um, random you know I had Jewish people that came into the shop for a suit that had no idea anything about the the, um, the community or, mm. and then they ended up coming to the to the show uh, you know to the synagogue on Friday evening so you're recruiting through your work so I was well. recruiting through my work as a tailor, but then I also the other the other way around. I made suits for quite a few of my congregants, and nice. quite, so it worked. The relationship worked very well, um, but it was just it was growing tremendously, and I had to had to decide which and, what way and to tailoring and tailoring in fashion one and tailoring in fashion one. You know, we we well, also wanted to come. Yeah, yeah I guess also you know it's you, it's not, I guess not only black and white, right? It's yeah, not. Yeah, it it's wasn't like it won. It was yeah. you know I'm still a rabbi. I, I'm I, practicing religious Jewish man um, now I have my own company now I'm able to to um, meet so many people from all different parts of the world and also have a platform and and still you know sure be that rabbi for people I have clients that call me rabbi you know that's that's how they go rabbi when's my suit ready you know and uh, not even necessarily Jewish clients sure so it's um, yeah it's it's combining the two uh, that, that's how I feel like that's how life is you know you have a magnificent beard and um, I, I feel like it has it could, you know ha, it could ha, even have its own Instagram account <laughs> <laughs> the uh, beard itself though wasn't always this long and fashionable though there was a time where it was uh, a, way way smaller so um, what what changed was there a, a transition was there a time where you decided to own up to a certain rabbinical status or a, a certain lifestyle that you know, progressed over time and you felt like, okay, this is something that I can own and, and step into? Yeah, so, you know, obviously, you know, years, this is this beard has been around, I would say, five and a half, six, six years, five and a half years in growing. Yeah, literally. Um, um, I would always, you know, take care of it and uh, um, early on manicure it a little bit. And then I, you know, I, I decided that, um, you know, I'm going to roll with it because it was obviously as it's, it was growing, it was getting out of control and I had to, you know, you know, obviously as, as a, as a religious, you know, I mean, many religious people, Jewish people that don't necessarily, um, um, keep their beards, which is fine. Um, but, um, you know, I'm Chabad and, uh, 
you know, the beard represents 13 attributes of mercy, and there is a lot of blessings. And and I felt like... You definitely got a lot of blessing right there, my man. I felt like I could, you know, I felt like I just got to go with it. And the beard started, it was growing, you know, it was, you know, five, six years ago, it was very small, and I was able to kind of fit into different areas and kind of pull off different looks, and I was able to, you know, wear a bow tie, and, you know, six, seven, eight years ago... And you know, I was I had no beard. It was it was, and uh, then it, it started growing more and more. And then there was this wild stage. And it was actually the time when I, when I was engaged. And it, yeah, it was super awkward. It weird. was it was like an awkward stage. <laughs> and and I, it was tough. It was difficult. It was yeah. a challenge to keep you. it to keep it to 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 roll with it. Um, was that something you know, your wife do I, had something to do I with think that? Or? My wife definitely had supported me. Mm-hmm. On keeping it, okay, because it was a challenge. I was, you know, should I, should I cut it? You know, should I take it? Should I take it off? You know, right. So what drove I felt you? Like I, I looked better, you know, in my days without it. You know, I, yeah. I, yeah, you know, I was, um, especially for for you know for for, for you know you worried about how you were looking and you know for social media etc. But I kind of was able to just go on, go with it. And then it got to a stage where I was, okay, this is it. And it was, and I was rocking it. I was, you know, I got some wax. I got some beard wax before it became like a really, mm. um, really big thing and an industry in you itself. You put product, you put product, you put, you, you know, what's Yeah, your, absolutely. I, 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 it's a whole, I'm sure, It's uh, It's a daily, routine. it's a daily, you know, it's a daily thing, a morning thing. You know, I condition it every morning and, and I have a certain wax that I, that I that I've been using for 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 five and a half years now. Nice. And uh, you ever thought of starting your own line? I have. I yeah. Have, but I there's so many things. There's so you know, many things. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm building this business and we've gotten all incredibly busy. But that's something that, you know, if I had a manager or something, I had. But but it's something that I want to do at some point. You totally. Know, definitely. So I mean, just to, to wrap up that. So what what do you think it was that I mean besides the look and the aesthetics of it, what drove you to decide to take on this new. Uh, this new lifestyle. And this, well, it was a lifestyle. lifestyle. It was more it of was, a it was happening. This it, was, commitment. it was happening. It was growing. And the, I just had to decide to keep it or not to keep it. Um, and I felt like, you know, at some point, I, 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 when, I was, when I was in this wild stage, I felt like um, I'm going to do it. And my wife was very supportive. Um, and that was helpful very helpful to have supportive people around you to, you know especially in a time when it was challenging sure. uh, and I went with it and thank God I went with it because you know it's uh, it is who I am um, I don't see myself without the beard at all uh, it is still growing till today uh, you know I had actually this question the other day I was like where is it going to grow till and at what stage like what are we going to do how long can it go uh, how long can it go and, and what am I going to do you know but it is who I am, and that's 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 what it is. Mm. Rep, you know. Another distinct feature you have, um, which you know I'm super obsessed about, is your hands. Right. You have massive, massive hands. Like, look how look. Let's pick up your hands for a second. This, these are big hands. Yeah, yeah. How? I mean, I these hands. How do you go about? You never think that a, a guy of your stature would be able to deal with stitching and this, such minute details. It's um, it's it's just, it's it's really it's really interesting and funny to see you like you know you're you're big you're tall you're broad. Um, I'll slow down the compliments. I see you blushing behind that beard of yours. Um, I'll take them. The, <laughs> <laughs> yet there, you know, it's just it's just funny that you know you think uh, that you you don't have any difficulty you know threading or stitching. No, or, no, no. I think I think my my grandfather, who I mentioned, was an incredible artist. He had you know quite quite large hands and and long fingers and you know and he would you know you know. Focus on very small point with the with sure. the brush and the thin brush and and I know um, it's an question. Yeah, I yeah. find it no, I find it, <laughs> it it works well for me. Thank God. Yeah. It, uh, you know, um, when I'm cutting it, definitely, and I have big shears, it it fits well. But I can understand the question when it comes to the, a very fine needle and thread, yeah. big hands. But it, it works. well. It works. And they say you know people with big hands have a big heart. Uh, hey. Nice one. Um, who is a who's someone that's alive today? That you would love to suit up. Who's like? Who would you like have a client? Love to. Have yeah. Who's your ideal? Who's your a client that you would love to? You know, that you love to just use as a canvas and dress them up to the best of your ability. That's a great, 
great question. Um, hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of many people that I would love to suit up. Um, obviously, from a business perspective, you know, to influences and things. But there's a designer today that's, um, for me, is a is a great inspiration, um, Ralph Lauren. Mm. And obviously, he's a he's another he's a designer. Uh, he's been making clothing for 50 years, but he's always been an inspiration for me. I've always when I, again when I had that journey through women's fashion I would watch his his shows and and he's always um, been at the back of my mind someone that I would love to meet and sit down for coffee with but if I had the opportunity to make him a suit that would be I think the the ultimate because I would be making for another designer someone that really appreciates fine art and uh, um, I think it would be that great experience he would be helping me and through the design as well, it will be that yeah. that kind of. Um, so, Ralph Lauren, if you're listening to this podcast, um, just know that uh, feel free to reach out to Robert Taylor Nussel, and he'll be more than happy to discuss with you those possibilities. And absolutely, sure. I mean, I, I think that's actually that's really great, Ralph Lauren. And I know we have our own agreement. I'm gonna hold oh, yeah. you up to it. Right. When I when I make it to the you know when I go to the red carpet, the Oscars, get the Academy. Um, when they ask me who I'm wearing, I'll be able to say, I'm wearing Tiffin Burton. But I just want to add one thing. You don't have to wait till the Oscars. Ah. That nice. suit will take you to the Oscars. Hey, okay. I like that. You dress for the job that you want. Exactly. I like it. I exactly. like it. I've got my eyes on this beauty right over here in the back. This is something really nice. Every time I come in here, there's always something new or fresh that's hanging that is like, oh my God, I want that. I'm a kid in a candy shop. And I have someone for myself, which I don't ideally think I'm into fashion. I mean, I, I clean up nicely. Um, there's always something like some eye candy that come in like wow that's that's awesome that's a new thing I really loved what? your cigar jacket that you had for a little bit the little nice little pockets shirt, you had for yeah, the cigars yeah. the shirt that was very cool very creative ways to bring you know you're, I always feel like you're always upping and changing up fashion in your own way um, practical comfortable fashionable designs well that's, a, that's the idea I just wanted to point on that is that you don't have to be um, really into fashion or something you know everybody needs that great blazer mm. or a great sports jacket to wear with jeans or like casual jacket that they could throw on every day uh, and with jeans or cotton trousers or whatever they wear on a regular basis so it's not just about making you know a suit for that meeting it's also about making that casual lounge jacket that casual shirt that um, that you wear every day and that you want to be comfortable and that's your go-to jacket because it fits so perfectly and you know and it, you don't even feel like you're wearing it that's the idea so you're definitely a trendsetter i would say especially in the community i mean in the world it seems like there's not that many people going to bestoke tailoring and and you of course with your knowledge with your background you, you learn learning from the press you learned in salvaro and different universities um but do you find that this there is do you feel like you perhaps started a trend or have you found that there are young people in the jewish community um, or not that have been reaching out to you and saying, "Hey, how do I get more into this? How can I learn more? Could you um, can I come work for you and be an intern by you?" So there, there have there, there, you know, there, there is definitely a growing, um, um, a growing interest in um, in tailoring. You know, I have some young um, apprentices working for me. Um, a lot of them kind of focus more on the fashion. They they're not so into, you know, working 15 hours a day on, on tailoring. You know, it's not, it sounds more, sometimes it sounds a little bit more glamorous than, than it really is. I mean, we're, we're working, you know, I could do it a 15 hour day, uh, 14 hours a day, you know, on a regular basis. Um, I'm just stitching, stitching, stitching. So yeah, you do have that interest to, but then sometimes it's, it's like, what truly is that interest? You know, and they, you know, once they realize that maybe it's not for them, maybe mm -hmm. they want it more be a fashion designer versus a tailor um, but there is I, I definitely in the world in general there is a growing um, interest in tailoring with young tailors around what's the world what's the biggest I would say distinction between being a, a tailor so tailor and a designer so a designer has this concept in mind he does these these twirls these mock-ups less handwork um, 
uh, much less than work and it just comes up with a design and a design a design that would would have other people uh, um, you know stitching and, and doing it for him and, and sometimes even has no idea how it's all come together but has the concept in mind and you know, like the vision draws it out puts it on CAD puts it on you know the drawings and everything um, sometimes obviously he, you know a, a more knowledgeable to, uh, a designer would actually know how it's made but not necessarily actually make it and and it's more ready to wear versus tailoring so instead of 80 hours that go into a suit over here which we do there's around uh, 20 hours um, mm -hmm. so it's 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 all machine made versus handmade right. so it's a very different um, concept is a very different uh, um, piece that you're giving to your client it's very and actually the difference between a ready-to-wear garment and a a bespoke truly bespoke garment um, is one is flat and one has got life on its own the jacket actually has life to it it's got that shape it's got the because it's stretched because it's 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 carved it's it's molded there is if you have it on the hanger it's actually you'll see it's got like you mentioned before, yeah. it's got its has it's got its own it's got its own <laughs> curves exactly yeah. versus something that you make ready to wear something that a most fashion designers would would, would produce. Um, it could be up to great stand. I mean, very high quality workmanship, but it's very flat. Mm. Fair enough. Yeah. So, right. so that that is that is I mean the difference in, in in obviously fashion as a designer you're able to to really and this is the part that sometimes I do miss is that you're able to really be very creative and, and come up with new things the whole time because you know, you're know you sitting there with your design and, you know, and you, your concept and you're putting it down on paper, you're talking to a team of people and they're doing it for you and they're coming up with different things and and versus here, I'm working with a client. I'm working yeah. with a client, um, he wants a navy suit so we gotta make him navy suits, he wants 10 navy suits. Mm. I make him 10 navy suits. So sometimes a little less creativity but Obviously, the fact that I'm making, so it's I'm I'm always using right. my creative skills. And I think what's interesting as well is the fusion between these two worlds, you know, Rabbi Taylor and such, um, is that I feel like the and there's a bit of a shift and change, especially with women's fashion and, and perhaps the, the, the forefront for men's fashion. That there's this uh, there's this idea that modest clothing is bland, boring, black and white, um, and I know that you, there are some pieces that you work on, the, the traditional kabata or different types of suits that people wear for the holidays. That you, and I know with women's fashion, there's some few women out there with designers who are bringing nice color and, and modest designs to the women world, uh, to the women's world. Um, do you find that you're sort of like leading away in in, in modest fashion or, or, or like Jewish fashion? I don't know what we would call it, but bringing a certain element that perhaps hasn't been around um, ever. Um. Yes, I, I know because I'm first of all I'm catering for 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 Jewish clients and non-Jewish clients and religious clients and non-religious clients of, of you know it's it's a very broad uh, my clientele is, is is very diverse which mm -hmm. I love, um, so I don't know if I'm setting trends but I am definitely helping I say push boundaries but helping um, even young religious uh, um, people kind of go with a different shade blue than they would use or, or, go, or go with a different, you know, go out there a little bit. And um, uh, that's definitely something that I'm, that I'm, I'm proud to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a black and white person. Um, my colors are definitely not black and white. And I'm definitely here to, to, to help anybody that wants to, um, you know, go get a little color Explore. in their life and, and uh, explore different different designs and different patterns and different color um, for anybody from any religion from any you know any background. That's the so, idea. what would you uh, share with uh, a young person who's you know torn or who has ideas of following a passion or a career that may be you know feeling that they're being stopped either by outside forces, in internal forces that um, they're not good enough or it's not even not conducive for their lifestyle. What, what, what would you share from your own experience that you, know, that you could give them some tips about going forth? You gotta, you gotta like bringing that Singapore, bringing, you gotta surround yourself by people that are motivated, by people that, um, uh, that have vision, that have 
uh, drive that ha that are successful. Um, surround yourself by by those kind of people. You got to just find circles wherever they are uh, and get yourself in it and 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 you know um, and get inspiration from it and then follow your dreams. Stick with them and um, you know make it happen there because there is definitely ways of making different dreams happen from from you know from every angle and and uh, you just gotta you know if it's if if you're struggling from a religious perspective you could definitely make it happen um you know from my experience being in a non-jewish environment um f throughout different companies in asia and in london um, and surrounding myself in non-Jewish, non-religious circles. Um, if you're proud of who you are and, and respect what you're doing and why you're doing it, and always be open to explaining why you're doing it, sure. others will respect it 100%. And you'll be surprised how much they respect it and support mm. you in it. And I think that's, that helps you to continue your dreams and, and, and to push yourself further. Because now you've, you've you have yeah, support being it. who you are and yes. to to continue. I think that's that's key. Mm. So what are what are what are some short term, long term projects that Tiverburn the brand is working on now? So at the moment we have our bespoke, um, you know, our, our, our level, our, which starts at forty two hundred dollars. Okay, made nice. in house. Like I said, from beginning to end, um, we are going to be launching soon, and we've already taken clients for it. Um, a lower range, we'll say lower range, but it's it's I'm working with a factory and it's finished in house. Um, it starts uh, in the two thousand dollar range and twenty two hundred dollars. Um, you know, people say sometimes you know forty two hundred dollars it's cr crazy, but uh, it's like in reality, crazy. in reality, it's not crazy at all. Um, you know, you have three to four fittings. Um, there's around three to four five month wait right now for for a suit at the bespoke level oh, wow. um there is a tremendous amount of work that goes into each suit so and it's something that will last you it's something that will last you obviously depending on the fabric you could get in really really expensive fabric and i could make it for you and it could last uh, in, a, in a week you know if you wore it five times but it's very much about the fabric choice and and obviously the, if it's the right fabric they, a suit like this could last you and your children could wear it too mm. so it, it's 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 um yeah that was the sorry that was the short term yeah sure that was short term long term um, what do you see different going in doing the women's tailoring potentially ready to wear um, I have a dream to to uh, to have a hotel with Tiffin Brin you know brand in it so hmm. not just to to keep it in the tailoring at some point but to develop the brand into into something tasteful something uh, that uh, represents uh, people but in all but that 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 you know that that people could have and and, and wear and sit on and 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 in all capacities in all capacities yeah. yeah it's a taste that i want to bring out it's the tailoring is one aspect to it but it's more the taste and the that that and the passion that i want to bring to people it's yeah. just the beginning just the beginning my man, I love it. I knew from the beginning, you've got passion, you got heart, and you also it's good to be seeing your journey blossom and continue and going to new new places and new and new ways. So all the best to you, Haslach and everything that you do. It's a real, real pleasure to have you on the podcast. We we'll definitely have to do it again because we just only, we only got the tip of your story and all the incredible things that you're up to. So thanks for taking the time. Thanks for the coffee. And uh yeah, we'll catch you in the next one. Thank you so much, man. Where can, every, where can everybody find you? Um, social media, Rabbi Taylor. On, on, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. At Rabbi Taylor. And the company is uh, Tiefenbrunn. Um, How do you spell that? So it's T-I-E-F-E-N-B-R-U-N. -E -E and on social media, it, I add NYC at it. So it's at Tiefenbrunn NYC. And Boom. that's the website as well. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. Above and beyond, my friend. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you.